Welcome to uh, Journey Gathering. This is the service for Saturday, May 9th. And um, I'm Andy Kaufman, as you know, most of you. And normally we meet on Saturdays at six o'clock. And when we meet in person, we meet up in Portland in St. John's at the St. John's Christian Church building at 8044 North Richmond. And if you're ever in the area, uh, why don't you stop by and visit us? We'd love to see you there once we are back in person, of course. Uh, Brenda, if you wouldn't mind, if you're watching, could you text me and let me know that I'm on Facebook? Uh, we're still online, but it looks like we maybe are on our way to in-person gatherings again. Uh, but we are in Multnomah County so we probably will be one of the last counties to open back up uh, when that happens. Uh, if you're not on my journey gathering email list, you can send me your email address and I will add you to the list. Uh, that way you can get email notices uh, about upcoming uh, events. And um, I put my email in the comments on YouTube and on Facebook. So if you send me your email, I will uh, keep it to myself unless you tell me it's okay to share with Pastor Dan. And if so, I will add it to uh, the Journey Gathering uh, email list. Um, so when I finished up at Dallas Seminary in 2016, I started a little nonprofit. Uh, it's really a church, uh, but I only have one member so far uh, because I got sidetracked helping out at Western Mennonite School for a year, my old high school. And then after that, I got acquainted with Pastor Dan and Journey Gathering. Uh, and so I haven't done very much with that yet. Uh, but I do my work with Journey Gathering through this, this nonprofit, this church, and it's called uh, Telos Ministries. And Dan and I are in ongoing conversations about how uh, we can work together and what the future might bring. And uh, telos is a Greek word that means um, the goal towards which a movement is directed. And the ultimate goal uh, toward which the movement of any church ought to be directed is that Jesus Christ and his gospel be proclaimed in the world uh, and that disciples are being made and being taught to obey what Jesus taught us, uh, the Great Commission for those who know that. Uh, and so that's what we are all about here. Well, this weekend is Mother's Day, and my mom passed away a few years back, so I don't get to see her anymore, not until I get to heaven anyways. But I am fortunate to have a couple of adopted moms, women who have played a big role in my life over the years and uh, who are still doing that. It's hard to imagine anybody who is more important in our lives than our moms. Dads are important too, but they are not mom. Uh, and Brenda and her brother drove over to Pendleton on Thursday to see their mom, Jean, uh, because it seems uh, unwise to actually go and stay with her at her home in Idaho. And I'm pretty sure that Brenda's mom really appreciated and enjoyed that visit. Uh, so we need to make an effort to honor our moms and show them that we appreciate and love them. Uh, it really is an obligation that we have to honor and respect our parents who raised us and got us started in life. And our moms are not always going to be with us. So take time to do that now. If you need to repair the relationship, do what you can. I realize that not all moms are good moms and some people have suffered because of their mom and if that's you uh, i'm very sorry not everything can or will be made better in this life well let's start off with the song and i picked it before i realized that it was mother's day and so it turns out that it's kind of ironic um, but it's a good song so. Children of the 
Heavenly Father, safely in His bosom gathered, nestling bird nor star in heaven, such a refuge e'er was given. God His own doth take and nourish, in His holy courts they flourish, from all evil things he spares them, in his mighty arms he bears them. Neither life nor death shall ever from the Lord his children sever, unto them his grace he showeth, and their sorrows all he knoweth. Though he giveth or he taketh, God his ch children ne'er forsaketh, is the loving purpose solely to preserve them pure and holy. Well, remember back a few weeks when we heard the story of Ruth, I quoted uh, Matthew 23, 37. Uh, o Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. So Almighty God and Jesus the Son portrayed as a mother hen gathering her chicks under her wings. Now that is amazing. Well, let's open up with the word of prayer, shall we? Father, thank you for uh, the opportunity we have to come together as a church. And we're thankful for our friends at Journey Gathering and for Pastor Dan. And uh, we also are thankful for the others who are joining in, visiting online. Uh, we thank you for the technology that makes that uh, possible. And we thank you for uh, your word that tells us your thoughts and uh, your will for us. And we thank you for Jesus who died uh, and rose again, that we could have a new life and become uh, your children. Pray your blessing on everyone watching and listening today and on this time that we have together. And we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Well, speaking of parents and kids, uh, we know this family and for some reason they didn't ever have children and I never asked why. Uh, anyhow, they decided to adopt and so they ended up with kids from different birth families and from what I've heard, the kids ended up with quite a different life than they would have had with their birth families. Not only are these people doing okay financially, they are also very strong Christians and have made the effort to pass on the faith to their kids. And neither of those things would have been true with their birth families. And I don't necessarily think that having money is what makes a family a good family but it does offer opportunities for children if it's used wisely. And uh, these people are uh, very wise money managers. Uh, we actually know a lot of people who have adopted children. I also think about our middle child whom we adopted from South Korea. She came over when she was four months old and now she is 25. Uh, I'm pretty sure that her life is quite different from what it would have been if she had grown up in South Korea. And I happen to think it's a better life, but I sometimes wonder if that is just the arrogance of an American, thinking that everything American is better. Um, but one of the reasons her birth mom gave her up for adoption is because her life would have been very difficult given the circumstances over there. So I do think it's probably a better life in a lot of respects. And plus, you know, look at how great her parents are, right? Well, we've been going through the book of Romans 
and Romans is really a long argument or an explanation of the gospel, the good news. The gospel is the power of salvation for all who believe. And we are now up to chapter 8. And so we've seen how we all need salvation because we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And therefore we have become separated from God uh, because we want to do our own thing. And we've seen how God provided for salvation through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus. Uh, before Jesus came to earth as one of us, we had this long demonstration project of the law of Moses and the history of Israel, which ought to put to rest forever the idea that we are going to achieve right standing with God through doing works of the law or trying to be good. It is by grace we have been saved and not of ourselves, and that is so no one can boast. Jesus' death and resurrection freed us from the slavery of sin, and sin is pictured as a destructive evil force. And so we are now in a new situation, a new economy, if you will. Uh, we are currently in a new economy, uh, but it's not a very good economy compared to the one that we had before the virus but the new economy of God's is uh, much better than the old economy. Well, we saw last time that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit set us free from the law of sin and death. And so in this new economy, believers are in Christ and indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And this results in new life and new status with God. And so we are up to Romans 8, 12 to 17, which I will now read. And you can follow along if you have your Bibles. That's Romans 8, 12 to 17. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit, that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. And so, first of all, we have a new life. And then second, we have a new status. Uh, but because of the reality of being in Christ and because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we have an obligation to live according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. And we know what an obligation is. That there is an obligation in the sense of owing somebody money, but there is also an obligation in the moral sense. This obligation that Paul is talking about is more of the moral sense. And you might ask, well, just why do I have this obligation? And Paul had said back in 8.11, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give new life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. And so this obligation is really similar to the obligation we have to our mothers. They gave us life and they raised us, took care of us. Now that we are adults, we owe it to them to make sure that they know they are loved and to take care of them themselves. We are obligated to show them honor and respect. It's not like we owe them money or anything like that, but we recognize them for what they have done and we treat them accordingly. But here, because of what the Trinity did in providing for our salvation, 
we have an obligation to God not to live according to the flesh, not to live according to our sinful natures, some versions say. The word flesh has a pretty wide meaning here. It's not just our physical desires, but the world, uh, everything that is characteristic of this life in its rebellion against God, that is the flesh. If we live according to the flesh, and this means according to 8.5, that our minds are set on what our flesh desires. When we were saved, we repented from the way of life that we had done before. And repentance means to turn about. It's a radical turning away from sin to a new way of life that's oriented toward God. Repentance goes hand in hand with forgiveness of sin when one becomes a Christian. And so repentance really is for sinners and it's necessary for salvation. And one dictionary says, an accurate understanding of repentance in the New Testament is essential to grasp the gospel message because it does not allow for someone to obtain salvation simply by intellectually believing that Jesus is the Son of God without repenting of sins and turning to live for him. And repentance is therefore necessary. As he says in verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Those who live according to the flesh have not repented. And so it's pretty clear that they are not authentically saved. At best, they believe in their minds that Jesus is the son of God but they have not made a commitment in their hearts to do what naturally ought to follow from believing that Jesus is the Son of God, changing the direction of your life to follow him. And what we are really talking about is a lifestyle of sin, of setting our minds on what our sinful nature desire, and then following through with actions. We're not talking about a periodic failure because of weakness or succumbing to temptation. And we should understand what the outcome is for that kind of lifestyle, the lifestyle of sin. If we live according to the flesh, we will die. And he's undoubtedly talking about eternal death here. It is a simple cause and effect, if then statement. If our lives are characterized by sin, then we will die and not merely because of the sinful acts we do, but because a life characterized by sin demonstrates that we have not repented, and therefore we do not have authentic saving faith. But there is an alternative. If by the Spirit we put to death the misdeeds of the body, we will live. Have you been watching the, the documentary, The Last Dance? It's the story of Michael Jordan's NBA career, focusing mainly on the 1998 season when the Bulls won their last championship. But they go back and talk about the first set of three championships, 91, 92, and 93. And before that, in 1989 and 1990, the Bulls were thumped in the playoffs by the Detroit Pistons, the bad boys. And then in the 1990 finals, the bad boys went on to beat Clyde the Glide Drexler and the Portland Trailblazers in the championship. But by 1993, the Bulls were, or 1990, the Bulls were tired of getting thumped. And so they, and especially Michael Jordan, spent the summer after the 1990 playoffs working out hard so they would be physically able to stand up against the bad boys the Detroit Pistons. And the bad boys game plan was to put Jordan on the floor every time they could. And so he had to train in order to be physically strong enough to withstand and overcome the punishment that they dished out. And that's what he did. And he won three championships in a row and beat Clyde the Glide and the Trailblazers uh, in the championship series of 1992. Well, that's what we have to do. We have to train hard and with the help of the Holy Spirit to put to death the misdeeds of the body, and then we will live. And we're talking about eternal life here, 
and so the stakes are very high. The bad boys of Team Satan and his demons will use anything they can to put us on the floor and keep us there. First of all, they will let us think that if we give intellectual assent to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God, that that will be good enough. But it's not. We have to repent turn away from our former way of life and turn toward God. It's not a case of earning our salvation, but proof of our authentic faith. If our lives are characterized by sin, we have to ask ourselves if maybe we've only given intellectual assent to who Jesus is. We want to be like Mike and not like Rudy Gobert the center for the Utah Jazz, who did not believe that the COVID-19 virus was serious. And so he spent his time at one news conference touching everybody's microphones, only to find out later that he was positive for COVID-19. And that's what we do if we don't repent of our sinful way of life. We go around sin, 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 because we don't take it seriously. But if we want to be like Mike and win the championship, eternal life, we will have to repent and then we have to train hard so we can overcome the bad boys of Satan and win. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, but we have to do our part and live in accordance with him because to a certain extent we have been given free will and the Holy Spirit is not going to turn us into robots. So first of all, we have new life. And then second, we have a new status. And verse 14 begins to explain why it is that we will gain eternal life if we live in accordance with the Spirit. And Paul says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And in a way, verses 14 to 17 and the new status are about God's obligation to those who have become his children. When our friends adopted those children and we adopted our middle one, we took on the obligation to treat our children, to treat them as our children, no different from any natural born child. Likewise, when we are saved, when we repent and put our faith in Jesus, we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, and we become children of God. Now, it's popular to say that all human beings are the children of God, and maybe that's true in a certain sense because all humans are descended from Adam. But the Bible would argue with that. In John 1.12, he says, Yet to all who received him, yet to all who did receive him, who received Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And so it is not all humans who are children of God, but those who receive Jesus, those who believe in his name. And here in Romans, it says that the evidence of this is that those who have authentically received Jesus and believed on his name are those who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit and who are led by him. And verse 15 extends this a little further. It says, The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. What we have become is children and not slaves. Slaves must live in fear of punishment and condemnation. One commentator says that Paul is probably referring to the ministry of the law when he talks about the spirit of slavery. The law brought about an awareness of sin and the corresponding penalty of condemnation. But as we saw back in 8.1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so in contrast to the inner dread we would feel standing before God, the righteous judge, we now have a sense of peace and security before God, our heavenly father. This peace is produced by God's spirit. 
in the heart of a Christian. Paul could hardly have chosen a better word than adoption to characterize this peace and security that a believer has. When we come to realize that the Spirit has brought about our adoption to sonship, we cry out with the same Spirit, Abba, Father, and that's marvelous. Earlier we saw that God is pictured in Scripture as a mother hen, and now he is pictured as a loving father to whom we can cry out, Abba, Father. So our awareness of God as Father comes from a deeply felt and experienced truth. And where some Christians base their assurance on facts and arguments alone, and yours truly probably tends towards that size of things, and others base their assurance solely on their feelings, what we need is more of a balance, not just facts and not just feelings, but both of them working together. And Abba is the Aramaic word for father. It's the same word that Jesus used when re referencing his father. And the fact that Paul uses the word here for a Greek speaking audience tells us that people remembered that Jesus had used it and that it was a treasured word. It also shows that since we have been adopted as God's children, we have a relationship with him that is similar to the one that Jesus has. That is a marvelous fact, and it ought to cause feelings of love and gratitude towards the triune God to well up inside of us. Not only that, but Paul says in verse 16, that the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And so another benefit of being indwelt with the Spirit is that he will give us assurance of our salvation and that we are God's children. Someone who is adopted by human parents might wonder sometimes if they truly are children of those parents. And sadly, some adoptive parents don't treat their adopted children the same as they treat their natural born children. And that's a terrible thing. We also have those bad boys from Satan's team showing up to whisper in our ear that we really are not God's children. When that happens, we need to listen for the spirit who will testify with our spirits that we are indeed God's children. Sometimes we might have to go with fact over feelings when we feel like we are not God's child. But the Bible definitely says that we are, if we are led by the Spirit. So we have to accept that as fact and listen carefully for the Spirit's testimony in our hearts. <clears throat> there is also a logical result of being children of God, and maybe that's another reason why Paul chose this idea of adoption to describe our relationship with God. In verse 17, he writes, Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. This concept is familiar to me because I'm an attorney and I work in estates. And so it's true in Oregon and all the of the United States, as far as I know, that when someone is adopted, their legal relationship with their birth family is ended, and they become part of the adoptive family in the eyes of the law. And so they no longer inherit from the birth family, but instead they become heirs of the adopted family. And there are some exceptions to this rule, like in the case of step-parent adoption. But the general rule is that an adopted child becomes an heir of the adoptive parents and ceases to be an heir of the birth family. And so the result of this adoption that is brought about by the Spirit is that we are heirs. First of all, we are heirs of God, and that makes sense because he is our father. Well, what do we inherit from God our Father? Primarily, we will inherit the eternal life that God has promised to his children. But I also think that we will inherit the blessings and the promises of God that we enjoy during this life. Well, second, we are also 
co-heirs with Christ. And it's interesting that Paul puts an if-then statement here. We are co-heirs with Christ if indeed we share his sufferings. Now, if you were to come to my Sunday school classes, you would know that I love conditional statements, if-then statements. And one of my Greek teachers, he literally wrote the book on Greek grammar, says that there are over 600 formal conditional statements in the New Testament, plus hundreds of implicit conditions. And so he says, it is no overstatement to say that some of the great themes of biblical theology cannot be properly understood apart from a correct understanding of conditions. And so that's why I love conditional statements. I would like to better understand what God is communicating through the Bible. Well, there are different kinds of if-then statements. There are cause and effect statements. If you do this, then something else will result. And there are equivalence if-then statements, like the one above. If we are children, then we are heirs. Being a child equals being an heir. But there are also evidence inference if-then statements. If something is true, then we can infer that something else is true. Now, I don't think we would like a cause and effect statement here because that would imply that we are earning our inheritance by suffering. And that can't be true according to other passages of Scripture. And plus, you don't really earn an inheritance. You receive it because of your status as an heir. An equivalence type of if-then statement might work here. If you are a co-heir with Christ, that equals suffering. That is a possibility. But I prefer seeing this as an evidence inference type of statement because it says more than an equivalence type. And I think that Paul is saying more. The evidence that we are co-heirs with Christ is that we suffer with him. And so if we are willing to share in Christ's suffering, we can infer from that from that evidence that we are co-heirs with him. If we choose not to suffer, then we will have to question whether we really are co-heirs because that provides evidence that our minds are set on the things of the flesh and not on the things of the spirit. And I'm not talking about a periodic thing where we say, I just can't do that today. I'm talking about a life characterized by such an attitude, a continual refusal to suffer for Christ. God is well aware that we are weak human beings, and he makes allowances for that. Psalm 103 says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, for he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. We are not perfect, and even if we are saved, we will fail from time to time. But God is merciful and a compassionate Father. And remember, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set us free from the law of sin and death. Well, there also is a purpose in our suffering with Christ. It says in verse 17 that we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. And so the suffering gives evidence that we are co-heirs with Christ, but it's not a suffering without a purpose. The purpose of suffering is that we can also share in Christ's glory. We will see in a couple of weeks the famous saying of Paul, <clears throat> and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, and the all things includes sharing in Christ's sufferings. I don't know if I have to tell you this, but the decision to follow Christ will inevitably lead to suffering while we live on this earth. Some of that suffering is going to come about because we are resisting temptation. 
the devil will certainly tempt us if we are following Christ. We are perhaps fortunate because we live in a place where we are free to worship as we see fit. And that's within reason, of course. Uh, we could probably meet legally in person right now because the governor's executive order does not trump the First Amendment to our Constitution. But it seems to us that the better course is to follow the governor's order for now. Romans 13 says to obey the government, but Acts 5 says we must obey God rather than humans, and so good judgment is required. Also, we might be right legally, but who wants to litigate that if it goes that far? And do we really want Pastor Dan sitting in jail for 30 days? Probably not. But there is real suffering involved in not meeting in person. For those of us who need contact with other people, especially in the context of a church family, it can be very difficult. Financially, many churches are suffering because the giving is way down because we are not meeting in person. But there can also be suffering involved in giving financially to support our church we have to give up other things that we'd like to spend money on. And some of us might be suffering financially because of the pandemic and the stay at home order. But if we are going to follow Christ, that means that we are going to have to give him control of our money. And our money is actually his anyways. And we might take verbal abuse from people for our silly beliefs. I see on the Facebooks all the time comments about how Christians are following a fairy tale. We used to live in a predominantly Christian nation, but we are more and more in the minority, and it will probably get more and more difficult to live a Christian life without some sort of persecution. But there are countries where if you become a Christian, your family disowns you and all you are left with is your church family. So being a Christian there can involve some very real suffering. And so we still have it pretty good here in the USA. The thing to remember when we are faced with the choice of suffering is that our choice to suffer shows that we are co-heirs with Christ. And eventually we will also share in his glory if we have shared in his sufferings. Sharing in Christ's glory means a glorified body and living eternally with him. And what will that look like? What will Christ's glory look like? He showed his friend John a glimpse of that, of what it would be like, and John recorded it in the book of Revelation at the end of the Bible. <clears throat> and this is what John wrote from Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. That is our inheritance. But don't forget the inheritance of those who do not believe and are not indwelt by the Spirit and therefore are not children of God. The very next verse. 
but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. The evidence that these people are not in Christ is that they continue doing these evil acts because their minds are not set on the things of the spirit, but on the things of the flesh. They have not repented and received Christ because they do not believe in his name. Well, adoption is a wonderful thing. It can take a child from a family situation and a future that may not look all that great and place her in a new family where she can be loved and flourish. Not that a mom or even a dad that gives up a child for adoption doesn't love her. In fact, it might be a great demonstration of love and a great sacrifice for them. We learn today from Romans 8:27 that when we are saved, we have new life and a new status. The new life comes about because we repent and turn away from our former way of life and are now led by the spirit who indwells us. But we have an enemy, the devil and his bad boys who are always looking to put us on the floor. So we have to be like Mike and train hard so we can withstand the assaults. But really we have to be like Jesus. If we live according to the flesh and not according to the spirit, we will die and we will die eternally. And that is not a good outcome because eternity is a long, long time to be separated from God and from everything that is good. We also have a new status. The spirit we have is not the spirit of slavery, but the spirit of adoption. By the Holy Spirit, we cry out like Jesus, Abba, Father. The Spirit lives in us, and he testifies with our spirit that we are children of the Heavenly Father. And not only that, but we, if we are children of God, we are heirs, because children are heirs. And we are co-heirs with Christ if we share in his sufferings. And that is not a cause and effect, if then, but an evidence inference if then where our suffering gives evidence that we are in Christ and therefore we are children of God but the suffering is not for nothing because the purpose of the suffering is so that we can be like Christ and share in his glory my mom and maybe people you know are already there waiting for the rest of God's children to join them our telos, our aim as God's children, is to share this good news with others so that they too can be adopted into the family of God. What a privilege and what an obligation. So we are going to move into communion now. And when we share communion, we remember Christ's suffering that his body was broken for us and that his blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And I have a song for you. And so it has four verses. So feel free to partake of the bread and juice uh, when you are ready. <clears throat> to endure. 
Breathe on me, breath of God, till I am holy thine, until this earthly part of me glows with thy fire divine. Breathe on me, breath of God, so shall I never die, but live with thee the perfect life of thine eternity. But live with thee the perfect life of thine eternity. Well, let's have a prayer before we sign off. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for uh, your word, the Bible, and for your apostles. Uh, thank you for what we can learn about you in what they've written. Uh, we thank you that uh, through Jesus and because of the Holy Spirit, we have a new life and a new status as your children. Uh, we're thankful that uh, we can cry out, Abba, Father. And I pray a blessing on all the people listening here today and a special blessing and uh, your uh, grace and strength for our uh, leaders in government and in the business realm uh, and especially for all those who work in the healthcare uh, industry as they put their health on the line every day to care for others. Uh, pray that uh, we will get through this uh, coronavirus situation uh, okay uh, with your help and that uh, you could redeem it for uh, your purposes, that your word and your glory may be spread uh, around the world. Uh, thank you for my friends at Journey Gathering and the others who might have joined us tonight. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God willing, uh, Pastor Dan is on for next week. And if you're looking for that, you will have to find him on his personal Facebook page. So you can go to uh, the Journey Gathering Facebook page and find Dan Pulliam's personal page there. Or if you look on my Facebook page, uh, he should be on there because he is one of my Facebook friends. Uh, I hope you all have a good week and I'll see you next time I am on. God bless.